Alrighty, welcome everyone to another episode of Get Ready. And uh, I am very excited to bring you my next guest. This is a man who I've known about for a long time, kind of known for a long time. We're, um, what I love about this guy is we're, we're very simpatico in terms of bringing humor into this tapping world. <laughs> and, uh, and I loved hearing an interview with him just recently. He uses the same phrase I use about the spoonful of sugar that helps the medicine go down. So I'm excited to bring to you today Mr. Steve Wells from Down Under. Steve's an international leadership coach and peak performance consultant based in Perth, Western Australia. He regularly teaches and consults worldwide with elite athletes and corporate personnel to improve their performance and enhance the performance of their teams. Together with his business partner, David Lake. <laughs> well, actually, that's an old thing because David Lake is now That's true, retired. I know. <laughs> yeah. I was very key to make sure I said business partner instead of partner. change our website and just <laughs> bring it up to date that David is now retired and basically, you know, having fun at Newport Beach where he lives. You know? <laughs> where I almost went up to see it because Andy was out there. Yeah. But we digress. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Formerly together with his former. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, Steve conducts personal development seminars and professional training workshops and advanced EFT, SET, and provocative energy techniques, which we're going to talk about throughout Australia, USA, and Europe, where he's heading uh, in a matter of hours now, I guess, to Belgium, I think he said. Yeah, on Monday. Yeah. Mm. Wow. So, um, so welcome, Steve. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. It's, it's so good. Yeah, as you were saying, you know, like... Um, to me, we're kind of uh, brothers in this uh, thing that we do. Brothers that get along, you know, because yeah. some people say you're like a brother to me. Yeah, I'm not yeah. a brother at times. <laughs> what do you mean by that? <laughs> but we've had more kind of psychic and electro electronic contact, uh, you know, but yeah. it's nice. It's nice to be on your show. Mm. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, my pleasure. I, I am excited to, uh, to introduce you to any members of my audience who don't already know about you. So I, so I love this, how, how you've developed uh, provocative energy techniques or provocative energy therapy, which one you... Well, we started out teaching it to therapists only. And then we realized, you know, like, um, you know, this, this because we, we learned provocative therapy from Frank Farrelly separately. And that's how we became friends because he lives in Sydney, I live in Perth. And then, you know, we had been attending these workshops and then we, we met at a an intensive workshop with Frank Farrelly. We became instant friends because of our uh, warped senses of humour. And um, anyway, so uh, and when we then we learned tapping, and we were kind of like we had these two separate things. And then we kind of realised like we put together they work so well, and um, and it's so nice to be able to use humour with tapping. You know, you you do that uh, as well, and you have your own unique humour, which you know we share a few. Uh, <laughs> well, it was interesting because he hearing you talk about um, PET and provocative therapy, that introduced me to Frank Fairley. So then I went and listened to an interview with him and, and found out more. Mm. And it was interesting because looking at how we both use humor in tapping and how, you know, you got this training from Frank Fairley and I look and go, well, I got my training from Ringling Brothers Clown College. And yes. just having that sort of absurd look at life. And so taking things to absurd levels, and it's kind of interesting because that's basically what Frank Fairley was going with. Just oh, yeah. Well, he, it's his Irish background, really, that, that he, you know, from his, from his dad and from that culture that he developed a lot of his, his uh, humour, which includes dark humour. And, and, in fact, I was reading a thing the other day that was saying that if you appreciate dark humour, you you're apparently more intelligent and... Uh, <laughs> I thought, finally, you know, people telling me it's all bad and wrong, it's okay. That's the validation I've been looking for for so long. All these years, <laughs> exactly. So anyway, when we did this, you know, we, it's kind of like when we were teaching uh, EFT, when we learned it off Gary, we started out teaching it to therapists and we thought, right, we'll get it out to the world through the therapists and, um, and then they will pass it on. But two things happened. One was that we we quickly ran out of open-minded therapists in this country. It's not a big country with, you know, we've only got 25 million people. And, um, and also we started to realise, you know, you, of course you could learn it for self-help and that you needed to get it out through the people and you also needed to go, you know, 
wider and look at other people who are helpers, coaches could incorporate it and so on. Well, the same thing happened with PET. And uh, at the same time, our friend um, Noni Hofner up in Germany, she was starting to teach it in corporations as provocative style. And, uh, you know, so she coined this term provocative style with uh, Uli Schachner. And, um, and so she was teaching it as a, it's a communicational style. It's just a way of, of being in relationships and communicating pe with people that is lighthearted, um, it's affectionate, it's, um, you know, you do it uh, with an open heart. Um, you know, I was reading the other day, I, was, I think it was Gregory Bateson said, you know, why do people see humour as always negative? In fact, there's a lot of talk about this in the world at the moment. He says, humour doesn't always have to be negative, it can also be loving. And you know what? When you're with your best friend and you're affectionately bantering, it's a loving thing. It's not negative. The content might be negative, but you both know the shared feeling is positive. It's enhancing. Yes, you can do it without that, without your open heart. You, you can do, you know, you can say nice things in a nasty way too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and people do, you know. Yeah. So it's all actually about the energy you bring to it. And, and uh, so I, you know, I learned from Frank Farrelly to have an internal freedom, you know, um, and that's what the provocative approach is about, is that you're able to go anywhere and, and look at anything, but also you, you are able to look at it in, in a humorous way. And uh, the tragic it last... It an opening then for some things that if you were going at it so serious, it would be really hard to go there. And, uh, and, you, and you miss so much. There's yeah. so many doors that can't be opened because they seem too serious, but it's like, hey, if we're having a laugh, open the door. <laughs> okay, whoa, that was heavy, but at least we got that open and now we can deal with that. Well, not only that, when, it's, when it is so heavy, it's also because you are stuck on the tragic side of the experience. And, and there is real tragedy. And, um, you know, even, even in PET, it's not all laugh a minute. We, we, we are doing the serious side and the humorous side. Frank said the tragic mask and the comic mask typifies the whole human condition. So the reason why our thing seems so funny is because most people are only doing the tragic side. You know, they don't think that humor should be part of it. You know, there was a, a famous psychoanalyst who said that um, humor should never be used in therapy. And he, um, Dr. Lawrence Kuby, wrote a book called Handbook of Humor in Psychotherapy. I read it. It's about this thick. And it is the most, oh, man, it is the most depressing book you'll ever read. And um, he said you should, you know, humor is inevitably destructive in therapy and it leads to doubts about the therapist's seriousness and um, it blunts the vigilance of self-observing mechanisms. And, you know, I think some people could do with a bit of blunting of their self-observing mechanisms, which are kind of observing a bit too much. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and, and it's like, oh. And Frank used to say, yeah, he's right. He shouldn't use humour because he'd stuff it up, you know. <laughs> right. right. And maybe he knew that and he was just jealous. If I, <laughs> if I can't play with humour, nobody should play with humour. Oh, yeah. But <laughs> meantime, you know, as you and I were discussing before we started, we both used the term, the spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, and then it really does. And, um, and you know, it's, it helps you to get new perspectives. It helps you to shift out of your stuck state. You know, when you, when you bring that humour to the situation, um, it's, it's so incredible when you have a client who was absolutely overwhelmed by something and now they're laughing at it. Yeah. Well, I remember Perhaps. when I uh, first learning about Gary would talk about the comedies, you know, he'd say the writings on our walls and the, the comedies. And I always loved that because it's because it's so often where we're working with someone and uh, and this thing that had troubled them for years, they then find themselves laughing at. It's like, oh, I can't believe that used to upset me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So can I, uh, is it all right to share, swear on your show if it's in context? You, oh, if it's in context. You can bloop it out if you, if you need to. Okay. <laughs> Where's so my beeper button? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm thinking of a lady who um, was coming to my office. I actually used to have an office at my home. We had a separate um, entry and so on. And um, so you had to come through the gate and then come through that, that door. And um, 
and she's she had been severely abused many years with her by her father and it was a you know we, we worked it was very and there was some very serious moments but uh, after about three or four sessions she comes in the door and she's got this smile on your face and she shakes her head and she says she says every time i get to your gate I just start, I can't help myself. I start smiling and laughing. She says, she says, it shits me. Because <laughs> <laughs> in the beginning, sometimes people are like, should I be laughing at this? You know, I should be more upset. Yeah. But actually, you've been upset for 16 years. Isn't that enough? Yeah. And how's it working for you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, how, you get more than that for murder. <laughs> You know? Yeah. I mean, you got less, sorry, less than that. See, even my jokes aren't quite hitting today, but, but you do. And I have said that to people because um, sometimes people have been tortured with things for 50 years. And, um, you know, Byron Katie says the only thing that's good about past things like that is that they're over. Well, for that person, they're not over yet yeah. until they do some tapping or they, you know, they they get to see other perspectives, they get out of the experience and, and humor takes you out of it, you know? Yeah. And it's a way of looking at the, like you were talking about how, um, well, like this, this therapist saying humor should never be used and this should. And that's why I always use the phrase, stop shooting on yourself and stop yeah. having other people shoot on you. <laughs> and that's, and that's the whole thing is why people hang on to it is because there's programming that says you should hang on to this. Oh, yeah, you you, yeah. you should not be free of this. If someone has hurt you, you should be angry for the rest of your life. And we go, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. Has that so ever worked for you? <laughs> well, yeah. so where's the benefit? <laughs> you're a natural provocateur, so you're kind of bringing out their own process and helping them to see it. Yeah. So your your pro this program is about um, helping people to move towards success as well. Yeah. And in the should area, I just say to people, nobody does what they should do. You know, they don't. The only things you're going to do are the things you want to do or the things you have to do. Yeah. So if you don't find some reasons why you want to do it or why you have to do it, you're not doing it. There's no way you're doing it while it's a should. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we keep, and we get stuck in that thought of seeing it as a should instead of recognizing what's really going on there. Well, yeah. the should is actually always about other people's or, or lo rules that we've learned. Absolutely. Know? It's like, oh, that's the way I should do it. Well, hang on, why? Because yeah. yeah. they want me to, and I need their approval, yeah. or or whatever it might be. Oh, why? Yeah. So well, um, that's part of our approach too. Is that we're you know we're a bit you know off center, so <laughs> not everybody is going to be attracted to our approach, and it isn't for everybody because some people you know they they get too stuck in various ways of thinking, and that and they. And they also like to do things more mechanically. We like to vary and, and experiment. And as you know, we've developed different ways of using the tapping and, you know, yeah. I just like to play around with it and try things out and test things and stuff, you know? Yeah. Mm. Well, as Ben Franklin said, you know, I don't know what the key to success is, but the key to failure is trying to make everybody happy. <laughs> there is no, you know, I don't know if any of the, of the practitioners that I know, it's like, oh yes, your approach will be absolutely the best thing for everyone. The rest of us, you just hang up and go home. <laughs> <laughs> and while you're busy making that person happy, what you do there to make them happy is making that person upset. Yeah. Tell you, every, you know, on my, on my videos, it's like, you know, you should do more of this. You're doing too much of this. It's like, <laughs> I always, I always love that uh, Wayne Dyer once talked about getting um, two letters and uh, one was from, um, somebody who was saying uh you know some program he'd done was terrible and someone else saying it was the best thing ever and he said i just took those letters and i sent it back to the other person <laughs> <laughs> here yeah, you yeah. have this letter I, and you have this letter i had that and, and this is actually by the way for people who are watching this this, this holds so many people back because they're worried about getting this kind of feedback yeah. and they're worried about being rejected and devastated you know yeah. and when i started running running seminars um, actually, originally I was running seminars. I was helping teachers deal with kids with behavior problems and stuff like that because I had some expertise in that area. I'd worked with emotionally disturbed kids. And, um, and I got this workshop, a particular one, where there were a whole bunch of people. They were, 
you know, I was like the ogre. They were going to, let's get the pitchforks and let's go, you know. <laughs> and there was a, an equal number of people who it was the best thing they'd ever done. Yeah. It was like two different workshops. My God, they went to two different workshops. Yeah, because you know? yeah. they came in with two different mindsets. And that's the thing is we can't, we can't control that. And, and people have said, if you're not pissing some people off, you're not trying hard enough. You're not putting yourself out there enough. <laughs> Well, Alan Weiss also says, and this is the key, I think, unsolicited feedback that you haven't asked for from someone that, whose feedback you respect, you know, because you do need to get feedback. But there's a lot more people willing to give it, you know, and uh, unsolicited feedback says more about the person who's sending that feedback than it does about you. Yeah. So, yes, get feedback, but don't, get it, don't take unsolicited feedback as, as you know, as real feedback, unless it's from someone you respect, you know. Yeah, I so said, look, you know, look and see if there's a uh, <clears throat> something of benefit in there. Tap while you're reading it, <laughs> tap while you're listening, and clear what's going on. But it's the thing: go, is there anything of benefit there? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. No, that's all crap. You know, <laughs> we we actually have a crap file. We we decided to keep them all in a crap. So we created a crap folder. And then we, sometimes I just go and look at it. Now I laugh at it. It's really quite funny. But That's when they come in, well, you and I are the same as everyone else. I'm sure you'll uh, agree. It, it still hurts a little bit sometimes to get negative feedback. But um, ultimately, eventually you go, yeah, okay. And you start to be able to go, okay, that's them. And for me, I must say, you know, like tapping really helps with, has helped with that over the years. And, um, Plus the volume of it helps too, you know. <laughs> the more that you get, yeah. the, when I was working with the emotionally disturbed kids, the first time I, was, you know, the first time I, I um, had a deal with a, a, a kid having, uh, you know, going, it was like The Exorcist, and I was just, you know, I was just, I was just, I was shaking afterwards. But after it's happened a, a hundred times, you know, you're kind of like, oh, you know, is that all you got? You know? <laughs> it's exposure therapy. You become desensitized to it. And <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm hoping this is going to be in some way helpful to someone who's listening. We're having just a, you know. If nothing you... else, at least it's entertaining. No, it no there's, a, there's a lot of great insights you're giving. But I do want to ask you, because over your shoulder is, uh, is your book, which I had the, located in the marketing position, yes. Like 100% yes. And, and yeah. Which I had the pleasure of reading is a fantastic book. And Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, this is a concept I came up with maybe 20 years ago, you know, and, and if, you know, you probably know it, ultimately it took me years to get the book from the original conception of writing the book to written, you know. Um, and I had to go through my own process in the end to get the book finished. And I know that happens to everybody. You know, James Clear has just come out with his book, Atomic Habits, and he admits that, you know, he blew the deadline three times despite his habits, you know. So, he was um, the first guest on this show. Get ready. Yeah, it's the same for all of us. And, um, and so with 100% yes, it's actually about, you know, um, being able to release the things that are blocking you from being able to go, yes, I'm going to do this and yes, I can do this and, and, and doing it. And so it's all about getting aligned within yourself with what you really want and making sure that it, it meets your values. And I even had to do some work with someone to, to get that over the line. I, you know, I, was, I was actually this um, uh, writing coach and she didn't do tapping, but she's like, I'm, I'm saying to her, this has to be worthy. You know, I had this concept of the book having to be worthy. And she says, you know, she's, I'll do the American accent. Now. She's, Steve, how committed are you to this book having to be worthy? And I suddenly realized I had to do my own process on my own attachments to this stupid idea of this, you know, and this is what people do when they want to write books. It's so big a thing that they, you know, they can't get there. And so I released that. And if you read the book, you'll see, you know, that uh, I got over my perfectionism. You know, there's, there are errors in there. And, uh, but I end up being able to focus on getting it out there to help the people who it can help. I don't know if you've ever uh, read the book, The Plague by Albert Camus. No. And uh, he has this, uh, this character who is writing a book and he's always talking about he's writing this book. It's going to be, this is a book that people are going to stand up and take their hats off to. And he never gets past the first paragraph yeah, yeah. <laughs> because, because he is trying to make it the most perfect book that has ever been written. 
Yeah, yeah. That's what Seth Godin said. Is if amazing is your benchmark, that's a tough point to start from. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, there's a there's a classic do you know Lunik? He's an Australian cartoonist. Mm. Lunik. L E U N I G. I E as in um, I for iguana. Mm -hmm. When we say I, it sounds like I for a lot of Americans. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> anyway, he's got this, in one of his cartoons is about this guy who gets inspired to, you know, someone, he reads about someone crossing the English Channel bound and gag, so he gets inspired to go and um, climb the, you know, Mount Everest bound and gag. So he's, he's managed to get himself bound and gags, and then he's like, I made it to the front of my house without any problem, you know. And then he trips over the front step and rolls out, you know, and he's out on the street and he's like, you know, nothing much is happening, but suddenly it started to rain and the rain moved him down the, down the thing. And he's like, I'm on my way, you know, and then, <laughs> and then he ends up, you know, he, he said, um, he ends up uh, at a storm drain uh, you know, where the water all goes down uh, under the road. And he said, my head entered. I decided to establish a base camp. And then, and, and he says, like, I fell asleep with dreams of Everest, which now lie within my grasp. And there's a Camus quote, and it says, all great deeds have ridiculous beginnings. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. It, you've actually, success is actually about getting started, and it's actually about being willing to have a ridiculous beginning and, and being willing to do something which... When you start, it's so far away, it's like, oh, this doesn't feel like it's only going to get, you know. And this is why, you know, the judging mind defeats you and, the, you know, the negative associations uh, get in the way and all that kind of stuff, you know. And that's what, that's the work that you and I do, is, is helping people to get over that, to be able to go for it, you know. Yeah. You can handle it. You can handle it, you know, it's that, that fear that we won't be able to handle the ridicule. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's it's always fun when I'm doing workshops and and I'm working with and someone's brought something up about that and you know the fear that I'll I'll look silly and I'll make some kind of comment as I'm tapping through. It's like yeah, you know, like having your face out there on uh, hundreds of videos on the internet tapping on your face. Can't yeah. even imagine what that must be like to uh, feel <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> it's like nothing any of you people are trying to do is going to make you look as foolish as what I do for a living. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, have, I have this thing I can't remember who it was I wish I, I could quote them um, acknowledge them if it's worth doing it's worth doing badly because everything you do well you have to do badly at, at first so um, and, and that's the problem is that no one's willing to start from where they are they want to start from where they should be you know they want to go no but I should be here and I've got to do that you know I've got to leap to there somehow you know yeah. well Okay, but actually, if you do a little <laughs> bit at a time, you end up there. Yeah, <laughs> and and nobody has done it perfectly the first time, and uh, and that's why we tap because it's it's one thing to tell someone just get over it, yeah, okay, but as we tap, we start to get over it and go, oh, there's a little bit of wiggle room there. Oh, there's. I had the same thing with uh, my children's book. Mm -hmm. I had written it and I was could not illustrate it. I was oh, it's going to be an overwhelming job. And finally, um, uh, uh, Marla Brucker, who I think mm -hmm. you know, um, I did some, some tapping with her mm -hmm. and uh, whipped out three times as many drawings as I thought I needed over the next week. <laughs> it's like, wow, this tapping stuff actually works. What a concept. <laughs> <laughs> oh, isn't it good too? You know, when it's it, it, you know, it's like with my hundred percent yes. You know, at one point I said to my friend, I said I'm about eighty percent yes on hundred percent yes. You know, I had a, but actually what happened was I discovered this intention um, tapping, what I'm now calling intention tapping. You know, which you you know about, and um, that being able to use that on my own issues helped me to get over the last little bit. And so we just need to keep you know keep looking for, you know, what's the next little bit. And sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's something that we discover in us. I mean, I, I made that discovery because I was tapping on all the blocks to, you know, being able to move forward, you know, and I got this heel spur and I wasn't able to move physically and it was a metaphor for what was happening in my business and I felt was happening in my life. And I was just throwing every technique I knew at this process, you know. 
<laughs> Something's got to work. <laughs> well, they're all good techniques, and I knew they'd worked. And because I couldn't go anywhere because of the hill spur, I'm like, well, I've got to do this. You know, <laughs> you brilliantly manifested the opportunity. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what most people say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're geniuses. We, we manifest the situation that uh, is going to give us what we eventually need. Yeah, yeah. But I want to learn some things through pleasure, not just through pain, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing is recognizing that, you know, and I, I often talk about people that, the, that we have this need to be motivated by misery. And so we make it so miserable. And if I'm yeah. really upset enough, then finally I'll do it. It's like, I'm going to change, you know, only through the tapping where we can start to break down the, those old, that old need to stick to the old program. And we go, oh, actually, I could find a fun way to do this. <laughs> I could yeah. actually yeah, yeah. enjoy the process and discover what I need without all that pain. Oh, yeah. Well, for me, uh, actually, I don't, don't normally do those theme things. But this year, I'm, the, the theme of the year is actually fun. And uh, so far, so good, mate. It's really fun talking with you. <laughs> well, likewise, likewise, uh, it is, um, you know, very, very happy to have this opportunity to do this. And uh, any, any closing thoughts for people on how to get ready for more success in their lives? Well, um, yeah. So the first thing is, if you want to have more success in your life, you've got to decide what that would be, you know. So, um, you know, if you're in the quicksand, then success is actually getting onto solid ground, you know, and that's, that's what you need. And once you're on solid ground, then you can go from there. But, but if, you're, if you're not in that situation or it's not that dire, it starts from what you want. Now, you know, you can call that setting goals or you can call it, you know, forming intentions or, or what you want to manifest or, or whatever it is. Um, that's when all the blocks will come up. And that's, you know, that resistance is actually what tapping is all about. And so, um, you know, we, we say, and I say we, you know, Dave Lake's no longer here, but in spirit he is, um, you know, he's, he's still with us. But... <laughs> <laughs> he's just up on the beach in, in over Sydney. Because you know, so. we joint, de jointly developed so much of, of this stuff that I use, I talk about we all the time, you know. Yeah. Um, and we do say um, one of the best ways to discover your unconscious blocks is to set a big goal. Set yourself a big goal that you don't know how you're going to do it. Yeah. And, of course, um, some people won't set a goal that they don't know how they're going to achieve. But actually, the minute you set a goal that you don't know how, that's when the creative process gets to start. But that's also when all the crap comes up and says, you can't do that. And that resistance is the stuff that you want to apply the tapping to. That's the stuff that you want to start to get interested in, you know, because that's actually helping you. That process is bringing up disowned parts of you that you need to manifest, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, that's the, there are parts of you that need to come to the fore that would never come to the fore if you didn't do this. So now you're going to have to increase your courage or whatever it is to get there. Yeah. And then you get to create the life you really want. So... Pushing exactly. those buttons is, is such a gift to ourselves. And, and I love you talk about um, resistance because uh, you, you may know the, the book, um, The War of Art by Stephen mm. Pressfield. And he just, he just says, the number one enemy is resistance. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If I only heard. there was something we could do about resistance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, because of the way people do this, they let the judging mind come in before they get creative. You know, so you've actually got to put the judging mind offline and you've got to kind of pretend, okay, I'm not really setting this goal. I'm just thinking about what I'd really like first. And then you come up with the stuff before. Otherwise, you know, most good ideas get killed before they're born, really. Yeah. Um, and then you let, the, let them get out there. Let this stuff get out. Once you get it out, then you can start to do something with it. Yeah. You know? yeah. Tapping this for that resistance. Absolutely. Yeah, it gives us permission to to go to those other th those things where otherwise, well, what Bob Proctor calls the terror barrier, and we back off from that all the time. It's like, okay, now we have a way of going. All right, I can get close to that. I can kind of hang out near it. Oh, I can move through it. Oh, there's actually nothing there. <laughs> and eventually, we do find it. Can I say one other thing too? Because the thing oh, I'm right. most now. Sorry, yeah, just one more thing. <laughs> 
<laughs> Hang with us, ladies and gentlemen. Steve has something important to say. The thing I keep seeing is that people have, have actually um, done things and then they've had relapses. And so, you know, this is what happens, for example, um, you know, people always talk about, oh, you set your New Year's resolution and then you, you know, you stop. Well, actually, what usually happens is because people have the relapse, then they go, oh, I'm hopeless, I can't do this, yeah, I'm back where I started, etc. You're not back where you started. If you start again, you're not starting exactly where you started, you're actually starting a little bit further down the track and you get to back to where you were before much more quickly than the first time around. And so it's really about getting back on the horse. That's, that's really what I would say. And, and you know, because relapse is natural. Everybody does it and everybody's, you know, trip to success is not like onward and upward, it's kind of up and down. So if you expect that, even successful people, they have reversals, they have relapses, and it's just getting back onto it, you know? Yep. Yeah. Trust and you can handle it. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for, uh, thank you for all the insights. Thank you for all the humor. Uh, <laughs> we definitely have in common is a, is a interest in laughing. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and thank you for, uh, for sharing all this with my audience. Uh, thank you. And um, I'll just put a little plug in if it's all right, that um, heading to Toronto, um, heading over to Europe later in the year, um, if people want to catch up there, I'd love to see them. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I'll have a, a link to your website, eftdownunder.com.au. Mm -hmm. oh. Or just... Uh, dot .com or dot .com.au, yeah. Okay. Um, so that depending on, on when you're seeing this interview, you know, if it's already past the Toronto workshop, Steve's still going to be going around doing all kinds of great workshops and, and definitely go and catch one. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>